Hey, so the general vote for um, this next lesson is aerodynamics. So I go ahead and I went ahead and put this together. I'm going to try to make this as quick as painless as possible. This is uh, there's a lot of subject we're going to be going over about air, uh, aerodynamics. I really like aerodynamics, but I don't want to get too in depth with it. I'm going to be mainly going off of I'm going to be mainly using the p-hack as, uh, as as a guide over this. All of this information that I'm going to be going over is all in the uh, p-hack. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be um, going back and forth between the PowerPoint, so it's not death by PowerPoint, and uh, we'll be going to the dry erase board since I'm uh, I, I like to draw and I like to uh, I'm sure you guys um, um, my version of, of this. Um, anyway, so aerodynamics, these are the things that we're going to be talking about, all of this. So as you can see, it is a lot of information that we're going to be talking about. So without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into it. So the four forces. Uh, as we all are very familiar with the four forces, we've got thrust, lift, uh, lift, uh, drag, and uh, gravity. I like to use gravity because it's it's... It doesn't change. Gravity is 9.2 meters per second squared. Uh, weight actually can change. Uh, so I actually like to use gravity instead of weight. Uh, but anyway, uh, going to the, uh, the board really quick. Obviously we have our, uh, let me get some, let me get my colors here. All right, so obviously this is gonna be, uh, like I said, gravity. So I'm just gonna draw this little vector right here for gravity. Over here, I'm gonna have, uh, drag this is the drag portion over here is going to be lift and this is going to be thrust cool yay uh, obviously right now we are in equilibrium right now um, now if we have uh, for example more thrust than drag there we go. And this literally means that our airplane is actually accelerating. Um, now it's going to keep on accelerating if we have this, uh, if we still have this factor here. My shadow keeps blocking the way, sorry. Uh, however, if we, uh, if we start reducing the throttle and we have, we're going to have a lot more, uh, a lot more drag than thrust, then obviously we're going to be starting to decelerate. And with that, we're going to have to add more and more and more angle of attack. Otherwise, this is going to actually start getting bigger, and this is going to start getting smaller. Uh, again, if everything is back in equilibrium, then hey, we are in back to straight level flight. Now, what happens uh, when there, there was a question uh, about the very first part of the of the in the p hack? is saying that weight can actually be part of thrust in glide, right? So when we're straight and level, we're going through the air at this angle of attack. However, once we start slowing down to glide, what happens to our angle of attack? When we, uh, when we start to glide, it starts to increase, right? So look what happens to the, uh, so here, let me, so all of this, all of this, is going that way, right? The thrust, right? Thrust. That's the vector because the airplane is going that way, right? Now, what happens if we start to go on the glide? Well, what happens is, oh, look at that. Now we're still going forward, but look what happens to the weight. The weight vector actually goes in as part of the thrust now. So that is what the p-hack was uh, describing. Um, it's very uh, confusing <laughs> the way it, the way how it words it, uh, but that's what it's talking about right there. And it it's not just that too. I mean, if you want to keep on going with it, all of this right here, oops, is all drag. So we got our drag. So we have our lift ratio going into the drag portion, just the same as weight is going into thrust. So I mean. Uh, I mean, it depends on how you want to look at it, you know, so um, and the same thing down here all of this is weight or gravity So the drag is actually being part of gravity now, you know, or weight so uh, 
but the p-hack only mentions that when you're in glide the weight vector um, can produce thrust um, so that's what that's talking about when you're in glide now when you go back to your regular uh, equilibrium strain level then the weight has nothing to do with thrust anymore it's just back in its own little uh, its own little vector all right and now we're going to go to angle of attack as you can see here angle of attack um, I'll again go to the board and I'll, I'll explain um, uh, some uh, stuff on the board. All right, so angle of attack. So I'm gonna draw a uh, a wing here. Okay, that's good enough. Okay, that's my wing. It's a horrible wing, but anyway, whatever. Don't judge my drawings. Okay, um, so. We have our, our leading edge whoosh, right there, and we have our trailing edge whoosh, right there. Okay. Cool. Now, if we draw a line, if we kind of split the swing in half all the way as best I can, keep that line right in the middle. And if you'll notice, this curve is kind of going with the wing but it's it's equal it's equal up here as it is at the bottom right this right here is your camber line that's that one right there now the cord line is a straight line from the leaning edge to the trailing edge so your cord line is going to literally look like that right that's the cord line cool okay all right so now we're gonna be talking about angle of attack really fast since we know what camber and cord line is most importantly cord line now that we know what a cord line is I'm just gonna draw a cord line of our wing and the relative airflow is coming at us at this direction it doesn't matter if we're <clears throat> if we're like let me try to if we're like this the airflow is still coming at us from that direction or if we're, uh, if we're uh, in a descend if we're climbing straight and level it doesn't matter if we're turning um, all it is is the relativity between the angle of which the cord line meets the oncoming air so like I said it doesn't mean it doesn't matter if you're climbing descending uh, <clears throat> if the airflow is hitting that cord line at this angle, then this is your angle of attack. Now there's some wings that are supersonic. Um, so as we all know how wings work. We have a low pressure here and a high pressure here uh, causes the wing to, to go up, right? Uh, however, <clears throat> there's some supersonic wings that look you know, like this too. Um, and these wings also do still generate lift, but sometimes they go so fast that this is creating too much lift and they actually need to go, um, they need to go downwards uh, to, to uh, equal out that lift with the, uh, so they can fly straight and level. So their angle attack is maybe, you know, like this in order to fly straight and level. But again, that is the, that's more in depth, probably advanced. Uh, <clears throat> but for if you're studying like supersonic aircraft and stuff like that, um, you'll notice that they'll also have negative uh, angle of attacks to, to their main straight and level, but uh, that's some extra research you can do at, a, at another time. All right, lift equation. Lift equation, I'm also going to go uh, use the board here. Uh, here's all of the, um, uh, the components in lift equation. Of course, we've got the coefficient of lift, the surface area, the density of the air, and uh, velocity squared, which is exponential. Um, uh, but like I said, I'll be going over to the board uh, here momentarily. Okay, now we have our uh, lift formula or lift equation. Uh, let me get uh, let me get a blue, get the blue color. All right, so I'll just break this down. Um, this is the way how I like to write it out because it's uh, I can really, if they ask me, okay, well, cool, you can memorize a cool. Now tell me a little bit, tell me a little bit about it. Um, like I said, I don't really think the examiner will really get in depth with this because you will never use this, but at least you'll know. So CL, what is this? Uh, this is the coefficient of lift. And this 
to, it, it all depends on the air shape of the, of the airfoil. So I'll just put, uh, I'll actually categorize these. Oh, it's this is the surface area, air density. All right, cool. All right, so coefficient of lift. So this is, this depends on the uh, shape of the airfoil. Um, oops. Um, and the effects that the, the shape of the airfoil has on angle of attack. So angle of attack, as, as we just mentioned earlier. Um, so these two things really uh, influence um, the, the coefficient of lift. That's literally basically, okay, based off of, you know, for example, a delta wing will have a, a so here's the, the flaps, ailerons. <laughs> um, here's the, you know, here's the Cessna wing. You know, you have our ailerons here, you have a big old flaps here. Uh, let's say, what else? We have a glider wing. We have a glider wing. This looks super long, right? Um, so these different types of wings will have different uh, airfoil shapes, different angle of attack, uh, um, di different effects on angle of attack will have different effects on these type of wings, and that's all included in the uh, the coefficient of lift. So that's what coefficient of lift is. Now, surface area is just that uh, now you can sometimes it's 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 uh, referred to as plan form uh, p l a n f o r m so plan form um, I'll, I'll just write it down here so if you want to look at like the like the plan form of a Cessna wing or, or, or whatnot. It'll literally have all the dimensions like from right here to, from here to here is, is probably square. So you do the, uh, you know, the cord line, cord line times the length between here and there. And then you do another cord line between, you know, here and you know, distance between there and here. And then you do, it's all, it's, it's crazy. Um, but like I said, this is <laughs> surface area. If you have a, a perfectly square wing, uh, you, this would probably be a lot easier, but um, if it's not, if you're dealing with something like a delta wing or something like that, I rec highly recommend you just Google, you know, plan form of the Cessna 172 wing or 152 wing or whatever, and it'll have that surface area there for you. Um, but otherwise, it's just going to be cord times the, the wing length uh, for surface area. So um, cord times the length. Or just look at the plan form. Okay, uh, next is air density. So air density is just that, air density. Uh, the more dense the air is, or the more, cold, the more cold it is, the better performance. And that has a lot to do with your lift. <laughs> That's probably why it's in there. Um, well, we can get into air density, uh, and I'll erase this, and we can get into air density a little bit, little, a little bit later. Um, and then this one finally is the um, the greatest uh, factor in this whole equation, which is velocity. Um, so this is velocity. Uh, this right here is also a component that's exponential. Uh, so I'll put exponential. I think that's how you spell it. If not, uh, don't, whatever. Anyway, um, we actually use this for the VG diagram, and uh, that's literally that. Um, so one of the uh, bonus questions that I had with, was, what is the uh, equation for dynamic pressure? Well, <laughs> let me get a different get a different color here. Dynamic pressure is. Right there. And the second part of that um, question was what instruments actually use this all the time? What instruments <laughs> needs this and this? Pedostatic instruments. Um, so this is uh, pretty interesting that it ha has the, that that's within the lift equation. I thought that was pretty interesting, but, uh, but yeah, that's the dynamic 
uh, pressure equation if anybody was ever asking. Okay, you don't really need to know all this, but uh, just like I said, just going above and beyond uh, about this. But um, all right, uh, before we go move on, I want to talk about air density real quick and I'll be right back. All right, starting off with air density. Um, so we're going to have <clears throat> a hot box of air, a column of air, and we're going to have a cold column of air. So what I'm going to draw is the molecules and the hot area. So I use this analogy all the time because, uh, as we all know, the hotter it gets, the more molecules they want to space out from each other. So just pretend this is a block of air or a room, a closed off room. It is really hot in this room. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's like 98 degrees in here. So we got these molecules in here. They want to be as far away from each other as possible because it's hot. Uh, they're just like people. You know, when you get hot, you get funky, you smell, get away from me. I need my space. Uh, just just get away from me. So that's exactly what the molecules are. They're, they're spaced out. They're spread apart. Uh, however, if it's very cold out there, you're in the Arctic and it's <laughs> negative, oops, negative 98 degrees. Missing the video again. It's negative 98 degrees. Uh, all right, guys, we got to get a lot closer together here because let's let's get as much body heat as possible. So this is what the molecules is going to be looking like uh, when it's cold uh, out out there, right? Um, everybody wants to get near the fireplace, whatever, huddle up or, or or whatnot. So this is what it'll look like when molecules. Now, if you have a lot of air molecules, how do you think your wings going to perform with all these air molecules? Obviously, it's going to perform a lot better than over here in hot air. You have no air for your wings. You have like, is that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine air molecules versus, okay, I'm not gonna count all that, but you get the point. Okay, so uh, so this is, this relates to cold, and this is gonna be dense, uh, or, or let's say a high pressure. So high pressure or it's heavier, it's a lot of weight, right? So it's heavier. I don't know, whatever else, okay, cool. Now over here, if we put these, if we really tip these on a scale like that, obviously this one's gonna be a lot heavier because look at all these other mole air molecules versus this one over here. So this is going to be, this is gonna be hot. And uh, it's going to be low pressure. Or lighter. It's going to weigh less. Um, so the whole, the, the tip, the, the scale is going to go like, mm, it's going to go like that, right? Um, so that's that. Another thing, low pressure, uh, heat rises. So that's another way how you can say that this is going to go up. And the blue is going to go down. <clears throat> this is very, probably a lot familiar when you're uh, looking at a prod chart, right? Um, you, you look at all that. Uh, another thing I wanna, I wanna go over uh, that relates to low and high pressure is this right here. So this is, you got two uh, columns of water, right? Um, and, it, and they're separated by this little red door right here. Uh, now what happens to all this water? So you got, a, you got high, you got a high pressure over here. It's heavier, right? So you get heavier. It's more dense over here. And over here you have, so this is uh, high. This is low pressure, right? So what happens if I simply remove that door? Well, of course, all the water is going to flow into here. The point of this diagram is the high pressure always, 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 always wants to go toward the low pressure all the time. Um, just remember this because we're going to get back into this uh, when we talk about wingtip vortices. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is the uh, <clears throat> how humidity affects um, uh, airplane, airplane performance. Now, when we have water in our air molecules, is it going to make the air more dense or is it going to be less dense? Well, if you have a column of air right here, all I can fit is nine air molecules in there. The molecules, or the wing needs air molecules. So if I were to, if it's humid, 
well then I gotta get rid of one of these right and I gotta add the water droplet in here so it's there water droplet oh now it's actually less dense because now there's only eight uh, air molecules let's say it's really humid out there it's humid humid and let's say we got uh, let's let's this one right here cool all right so now we have <laughs> we had we had nine uh, air molecules at first really dense air now we only have five uh, so the air is not as dense anymore because um, it's being replaced by these water droplets. So the higher humidity, the less uh, air molecules you have and the less aircraft performance you're gonna have. Um, so that's, that's that. All right, the VG diagram. This is the VG diagram. This is the one where everybody <laughs> fears um, only because I don't think it's ever taught uh, correctly. Um, but again, we'll go over to the board and I'll show you the easiest way how to do this. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll understand and you'll be like, oh, why couldn't I understand this uh, before? The VG diagram is mainly for commercial pilots, uh, but even if you're do going through instrument or private, you're going to have to learn how to do this anyway. So um, let's go ahead and jump to the board. Okay, the VG diagram, really quick. Um, it's one of my favorites because this is one of the topics that I really did not get um, because uh, I was probably just not instructed the right way in, in my way of learning. Um, so I'm going to hopefully show you a way that we, you can actually do a VG diagram from scratch uh, with ease and you hopefully by the end of this you'll be able to f f do a VG diagram and look at it and be like oh this is this is simple because there's a lot of uh, uh, fear out there when it comes to the VG diagram especially for commercial pilots so um, whether if you're a, a, a private or instrument um, I, I mean you might as well learn how to do this because you're going to be able to doing it you're going to be doing it anyway in your commercial so let's go ahead and just get right into it. What is the purpose of the VG diagram? Well, the VG diagram is um, all of the limitations of the aircraft and the aircraft speeds uh, uh, versus Gs. So that's why on, on the Y axis on this, you have uh, load factor normally, uh, if you look in the P hack, and then the X uh, axis, you have uh, the airspeed. Well, airspeed is actually velocity, and you have uh, your load factor, which is Gs. So if you take your velocity v and g put them together you have your vg diagram uh, on your airspeed indicator you have the green range you got the yellow range you got the red range and never exceed speed the vno the vne where does the manufacturer get that information huh from the vg diagram so um there's two types of utility aircraft uh two types of aircraft and a weight range you got your utility and you get you got your normal so the noted to start the vg diagram you need two things whether well, actually three things. I mean, what kind of aircraft you're gonna be doing the VG diagram for, right? And then you're gonna be wanting to your load. Uh, your, you need your weight. So if you're gonna be in the utility category, then it's gonna be 4.4 Gs maximum and 1.76 uh, Gs uh, for negative. And then the next thing you're gonna need is your, your, v, your V speed. So you need your VS. I'm gonna do VS, I'm not gonna do VS, so I'm just gonna do VS, and this is gonna be for 172. And then I'm gonna do the VNO and the VNE. Those are the things that you're, that's gonna be critical for you to, to use. The next thing you're gonna need is um, the, uh, just like how we talked about in the lift equation, how velocity is squared and in, in ex exponential. So in other words, um, the, the faster you go, uh, let's say if your speed is doubled, your the G's is going to be. I'm, I'm sorry. If yeah, yeah, your <laughs> your G's is going to be quadrupled. Um, so that's why we're going to need these equations. So for every one G, you're going to do the square root of one times the stall speed, and then you're going to get these numbers over here. And uh, we'll explain what these numbers are here in a bit. Okay. Um, as I was saying, I got to like separate these videos for, like two uh, two minutes, otherwise the the video quality is going to be a crap when I try to uh, upload it. Anyway, um, so as I was saying before, um, you need to know that the square root of the load factor, uh, you got to do the square root times the VS, okay? So that being said, you can go ahead and put your load factor. Uh, these are all your Gs. So this is 0G, uh, 1Gs, 2Gs, 3Gs, 4Gs, and then the faster you go, let's say you go 80, uh, at, let's say, if, can your airplane go 80 knots? at three g's well can it well what kind of range will it be in will it be in a normal operating range the vno speed vne 
will be structural damage. This is the whole point of the VG diagram. So let's go ahead and start from scratch. And it's gonna be very, very simple. Hopefully by the end of this, you're gonna be like, oh, that was it? <laughs> Literally, yes, that, that, that is it. All right, so I, I kind of did some kind of calculations ahead of time, um, but this is the equation you're gonna wanna know for your VG diagram. You're gonna need your load factors times the stall speed. And that's how you're gonna get all these points on here, right? I've already did the calculations right here. So the V, so the G's, uh, the square root, of run square root of one times the 48 stall speed is actually 48. So we find the G of one, G of one, we go 48, we go up 48 to one and we make a little mark. Let's make a little mark right there. Okay, oh, sorry, my trying to aim my phone. So there's your 48, and they're at 1G, right? Here's 1, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, okay? Next, what's our load factor for 2? What's the velocity there? So square root of 2 times 48 is going to be 67.9. It's rounded up. You can put 68 or whatever. Same thing here. So 60, here's 70. So 67 is like right there. We're going to go all the way up to... Um, Oh shoot, I keep, my phone keeps, there we go. All right, there is the two. Okay, then we do the same thing with three. And also, you're gonna do the same thing with uh, the negative two, all right? So negative is gonna be 48, so we're gonna do the same thing here. So negative one G is 48, so we'll do the same thing here. Here's 40, I'll, I'll actually do this in red. So here's uh, 40, uh, all right, there we go, 48. And then two is gonna be up here, so 67.9. So we go over 67.9 and we go up to two. Now, obviously we can't go any down any further. Why? Because uh, we've already exceeded our negative, uh, our negative Gs for utility aircraft. So 1.76. So negative 1.76 is like maybe right there. So let's draw a red line going all the way across. I'm trying to make this as straight as possible. Anyway, you get the point. Okay, um, so that's that. Um, now we're gonna keep on going up. So next is gonna be three. So the square root of three times 48 is 83.1. Let me get back my black marker. So 83.1, 80, here's 90, 83.1. We're gonna go up to three. And I mean, you, I mean I'm pretty sure you're getting the point by now. It's very, very simple. Uh, and four. Screw to four times 48 is 96. 96 is gonna be right around here. And here's 96, we're gonna go up to four, right here. Could we stop there? Well, we might as well keep on going because our limitation is 4.4 Gs. We only did four, so we might as well go up one to five, right? So square root of five times 48, 107.5 or three, whatever that is. Let's just pick 107. So same thing, 107, we're gonna go all the way up, and it's gonna be right about here, right? Cool. Um, now, G's are gonna be right here. So just like I did with the negative, gonna put a line right there all the way across. Okay, all right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect the dots. So starting from zero, we're gonna go all the way up, connect the dots, connect the dots, connect the dots. Yay, yay, yay. And then, of course, the dots are supposed to be. And I, you can keep on going or whatever. I mean, you can go unlimited. But obviously, it doesn't make any sense to keep going past 4.4 4. 4 Gs because what's the point? Your aircraft can't go up past that point anyway. So, same thing with the, let me get my red marker. So, here's the negative Gs. Going negative, connecting the dots. And there it is. There's no point of going past uh, 1.76 because that's our limitation of our aircraft. So anything within here, it's gonna be all, this is structural damage right here. Structural damage, same thing up here. This is the 4.4 up here. All of this is gonna be Structural damage. Same thing, okay. Oh, we're getting getting somewhere now. I'm looking, looking a little familiar there, okay. All right, so first of all, our stall speed, remember it was 48, right? So if you go all the way up here, 
and our 48 at 1G, we're gonna, so this is our stall speed right here. So right here, that point right there is our stall speed. All right, and this is where your green arc is probably gonna start on your airspeed indicator, okay? All right, now where this green arc is, I don't know if I did this uh, with any one of you guys yet, but uh, accelerated stall. That is, is uh, you can stall at 48 if you're going 1G. However, if you're going uh, 3Gs, I mean, if you're going, let's say, 80 knots, and you pull 3Gs, if you, if you bank the aircraft and you pull, then you're going to be in an accelerated stall area. You can literally stall the aircraft at 80 knots or 100 knots or, or whatnot. And that's the accelerated stall. Uh, commercial pilots, you'll never, you, you will have to uh, do this. Private pilots, I don't think you'll ever will. Um, but uh, when you get to the commercial range, you will have to do this uh, just to just to um, um, to demonstrate that yes, the aircraft can stall when you're going, even though you're going faster than 48. Um, all right, moving on. Now, when this accelerated stall matches the 4.4 limitation, this is going to be your VA, VA speed, your maneuvering speed, and that's going to change. Um, remember when I was saying that, uh, I don't know if I've, well, for most of you at least, hopefully by now, um, that the heavier you are, uh, the faster you have to go for your, your uh, maneuvering speed. The lighter you are, uh, the the less, uh, the slower your maneuvering speed that, that is, that's going to be. So this right here is considered, let's say, I don't know, 2,000, I don't know. 2300 pounds okay now let's say if we're 2400 pounds and guess what your stall speed is going to actually increase so if you're heavier and you're below this you're going to probably stall because you're heavier right it just makes sense so this curve will actually look like this it's going to be the same exact thing however again we're heavier right we're heavier look at that now the va actually moved over if we moved over, now our VA is now 100 and, and uh, whatever that is. Before it was, let's say, I don't know, 95. Now that we're heavy, oops. Now that we're heavier, now it's 105 or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, um, I'll get into a VA uh, in another video too to, to actually explain this too. But um, the VA, di the VG diagram is based off of the current. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that your current um, weight too. So this can also change automatically too, uh, depend, depending on the weight and all of it. So there's other factors too, but just to keep it simple, um, this is uh, your VA right here. It's gonna be your stall speed. And obviously right here, if you go below uh, 1.76 at whatever airspeed, then hey, you're gonna be structural damage. You're gonna have structural damage over here. Um, starting with the also with the V with the uh, V and O. Remember we need a V and O and V and E. All right, so let's go to our V and O. Our the aircraft is 129 based off the manufacturer's recommendations. So we're going to find 129, and we're going to go draw a line all the way up as straight as I can. All right, so that is your V and O line. You go past 129 anywhere in this range and hey then you're going to be in the uh, caution range right uh, let me get my red marker uh, the vne speed never exceed is our structural damage right so now we have a line from straight up from 163 and that's it now it's starting to look like a vg diagram the hardest part of this vg diagram is this right here and it's really not that difficult Square root of one times 48 is 48. Well, square root of two is 67.9. Square root of this, square root of that. All you gotta know is the, the um, your your stall speeds for your particular aircraft, your numbers, just dot the aircraft. I mean, I'm sorry, dot the aircraft. Dot the, uh, the diagram according to your Gs and line them up with the speed, and then you connect the dots. I mean, that's literally all you have to do. Uh, your 129, I guess, like I said, your um, your your VNO, line that up. Your VNE, line that. Obviously, any anything over here is going to be structural damage, um, or I'm sorry, no structural failure. Um, this is going to be structural damage, structural damage. And there's there's a point in here that you can actually find in the POH. How many G's does the aircraft can withstand before it actually has structural failure? So structural damage, you'll you'll actually damage the wings. 
um, structural failure, meaning like your wings will probably fall off at that point or something like that. Um, so that's that's literally what that is. Now these these ranges. All right, so we have our accelerated stall range, which is all above this curve, right? That we where we connected the dots originally. Anything to the left of that is going to be your accelerated stall. Um, anything to the right inside this green area right here. Everything that's within this range right here is all of your normal operating range. So this is the green arc, right? Over here we have the anything past your uh, <clears throat> your VNO from your VNE. This is going to be your op your uh, your VNO range, right? Your cautionary range. All of this is going to be your cautionary range. So you can be at this, you can be, you can be flying at 140 knots up to 4.4 G's, and then you'll still be within that range. Now, if you're outside of that, if you're going up here, five G's, and guess what? You can expect some structural damage. If you're going 164, you can expect some structural damage. If you're going uh, 140 knots or 160 or 150 knots, and you're doing below you're doing more than negative two g's well guess what you're going to expect some structural damage so that's literally the vg diagram in a nutshell it's a very very simple diagram uh but once you i mean looking at it at first i mean if i would have just started up with this video like this you probably wouldn't looking at this like what the heck is all this um but yeah starting from scratch i mean it's really really a simple diagram to start um anybody can do it um, even at the private level, it's it's really not that complicated um, as long as you're as long as you're shown the right way to do it. Now, the most complicated part in this whole diagram is drawing this line and putting the equations on here. So, what's the square root of uh, one times forty eight? Oh, forty eight. Square root of two times uh, forty eight. Sixty seven point nine. So, this is the hardest part right here, and then putting the dots, lining up the dots with the G's versus the airspeeds. And then just drawing the lines. It's, I mean, it's, it's not really that difficult. <laughs> it's, I can't make it any simpler than that. Uh, if you have any questions on it, just just let me know. I, I'll explain it a little bit better if, if I if I can. But um, uh, this is one of those subjects that a lot of people are are getting confused on, and I don't, I, I don't know. I, hopefully, you're not confused anymore at, after this. Um, but anyway, moving on. All right, types of drag. Um, I'll go to the board as well. Uh, this is where I'm going to talk about lift induced drag, um, how it uh, how it affects adverse yaw and ground effect and all that good stuff. So, uh, with that being said, let's go to the board. Another thing I want to talk about really quick before I move on is the uh, <clears throat> the VA speeds and understanding why do we have VA speeds? What do they what do they actually mean? So, and why they actually increase as we're heavier. And why, and when we're lighter, the VA speed actually goes down. It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, well, at least it didn't for me when I when I first learned about VA speeds. Uh, so VA speeds. Let's say you're flying around, flying around, and you are heavy. Okay. When you're heavy, the aircraft is going to be heavier. So what does that mean? You have to, you need an extra angle of attack to be able to compensate for that weight, so you can you can keep you can keep uh, flying straight. Um, if you have your angle of attack like this, guess what? The aircraft's gonna gonna eventually start descending because you're heavier, right? Just makes sense to add that angle of attack. And of course, I'm exaggerating like crazy for the purpose of the video. But anyway, <clears throat> and if you're lighter, uh, guess what? You're actually gonna be going upwards. So you don't need that extra angle of attack. You're actually gonna be at a lower angle of attack. Um, and this is how you fly when you're really, really light. So with that being said, the critical angle of attack for the Cessna, let's say it's uh, 12 degrees, I don't know. So this is, uh, you are heavy and you're light over here. So heavy, like I said, you need a higher angle of attack. And if you're light, you need a less angle of attack. So let's say this angle of attack is like, I don't know, three, and this one's, uh, I don't know, let's say it's six, whatever, okay? Um, we need this angle of attack to go straight in a straight line. We need this angle of attack to go in a straight line. So three, let's say we have, we weigh 1,200 pounds over here, over here we weigh 2,300 uh, pounds, 
All right? Okay? Everybody with me so far? Now, in order to maintain this altitude going with this much weight, with this much angle of attack, we got to be going at least, I don't know, let's say 100 and, 110 knots. Let's say 110 knots, right? Over here, we don't, we're, we're light. We don't need all the extra speed to be going to just to maintain altitude. So we can actually be at, let's say, uh, I don't know, 95 knots. Okay, so there's a difference there, right? Uh, now, where does VA come into place? Where does this have anything to do with VA? VA um, is, meaning if you're going at 110 knots, what I can do is I can pull the yoke back briskly all the way back, and the aircraft will actually stall before uh, I do any kind of damage to my wings. If I'm light, 1,200 pounds, and I'm going 95 uh, knots, I can pull the yoke back all the way, and I'll stall before I, I create any kind of uh, structural damage. Um, just like how the VG diagram was, was showing us, remember that accelerated stall? So let's say the critical angle, every wing has a critical angle of attack, right? So let's say the critical angle of attack is right here. Let's say it's 12 degrees, right? Same thing here, 12 degrees. Okay, <clears throat> so we got three. And then we got 12, so we're, we're already halfway there over here. Now, if I go, if I'm at 110 knots, I'm our, my angle of attack is already up right there, right? Now, if I pull the yoke back and I, it's going to get to 12 degrees a lot quicker before any kind of structural damage would, would occur, right? So the airplane would actually stall right there and it would actually go back down. That is your VA. Same thing over here. I'm not going as fast, so I have all this extra room to go ahead and pull the yoke back. And it's going to travel all the way back here, and it's going to stall first before any kind of structural damage. Now, what if I'm going 110 knots, and then I pull back by going 3? I got to look at all of this extra distance I have to travel, or the wing has to travel before it hits its cradle critical angle attack going at this speed you will you're gonna over G the aircraft for one uh, because you have all this extra angle of attack room uh, <clears throat> to to enable to uh, reach that um, that G that 4.4 G or whatever category that you're in um, and then you're gonna break the aircraft just like how the VG diagram says that's why when you're a lighter and you don't have that much angle of attack, you need to be going slower because you need to allow the aircraft to travel all of this distance to uh, get the uh, the critical angle of attack before the aircraft breaks. So that's why we can't be going 110. We need to be going back to 85 or 95 or whatever airspeed I said. So that's what the, uh, the VA speed is and that's how we calculate it too. Okay, now we're going to be talking about drag. Well, two types of drag. We got lift-induced drag or induced drag, and we have uh, parasite drag. So we have, uh, oops, induced. Oh my gosh, my handwriting is getting worse and worse. And parasite drag. So induced. Just remember, induced is caused by lift. All right. So every time you have a lift. You're, you're gaining something, right? Anytime, this is a world where if you, uh, if you get something, you have to give something. So lift, we get lift. Yay, we have a positive kind of energy or whatever, however you want to call it, whatever. Anytime you have that, you're going to have something to pull that lift back, which is drag, which is induced drag or lift induced drag. Um, I'll get into that a little bit, a um, little, little bit later too. And this is why we have different kind of um, uh, uh, ailerons too, due to adverse yaw. So adverse yaw has a lot to do with induced drag. Uh, but right now, let's we'll talk about parasite drag. Uh, so there's there's uh, there's form there's form drag. There's skin drag or or uh, uh, friction drag, skin friction. I'll just put skin friction. And there's interference.
interference drag. So what, are the, what, what in the heck is the, what, what does this mean? Form drag. Let's say if you have, um, I'm pretty sure they have this in the, in the P-Hack too. They have like this, they have a ball, they have a box. Um, it's been a long time since I looked. They have a, a shape like this and they have a, I don't know, just a wall like that, right? If these objects are going through the air, which one do you think is going to have less drag? Obviously, probably C, C, and D. <laughs> anyway, um, so A, obviously, it's it's it, it's kind of aerodynamic or whatever, but you're going to have a lot of drag right there, right? Now, this next one, obviously, is a box, uh, just like a tractor trailer riding through the highway, and you're going to have a lot of you're gonna have a lot of um, uh, issues right here, and you're gonna have a lot more drag by there too, right? This is gonna be slamming into it, slamming into the wind, so that's gonna be slowing you down. <clears throat> and then you have um, another uh, a lot of drag back here because not really aerodynamic. However, this one, it's gonna be nice and streamlined. It's just gonna flow right past it as if the wind's never even gonna know it's there. Um, and then of course you have this one. This is very similar to the box. Um, you got a lot of wind just slamming against this wall right here and then air is going to go around Then you're going to have a lot of drag back here a lot of drag uh, So that's literally um, The shape of the wing the aircraft the fuselage everything right that is what form drag is now skin friction is uh, Exactly why the space shuttle uh, gets um, really hot um, during entry, you know, you have a lot of this you have a lot of uh you got a lot of air molecules here's air molecule air molecule air molecule yay and if you put an object through this super fast you're gonna actually create all kinds of friction just like how you take your hands and you rub them together it gets hot it's the same thing one hand is my air molecules the other hand is uh let's say uh your your aircraft or your fuselage um, or hence the space shuttle. That's why uh, it gets so hot on re-entry and they have to um, have all these crazy plates and, and specially designed on the bottom of the spaceship because otherwise we'll just burn up and re-entry. It's nothing the fact that the, the atmosphere is super hot or anything like that. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, there was a YouTube video of a of an uh, of some guy that went up on a hot, hot air balloon. I think it was like sponsored by Red Bull or something. Uh, but he literally jumped uh, from space and uh, I mean he didn't burn up or anything like that because he wasn't going Mach 25 uh, But if you're going Mach 25 through the atmosphere, yes, you're gonna be burning up pretty pretty good um, so Anyway moving on uh, so that's form skin friction now, interference drag. What the heck is interference drag? Um, I don't like the so that you have your you have your fuselage here you have your your propeller and then you got your wing yay they say that a lot, of, even in the P hack, I believe that um, they they describe as interference drag is the this drag right here where the fuselage meets the wing. I don't really understand that. I, it, that should be part of form drag, right? So I'll explain it a little bit better because I don't think they did a good job on that. So if you have um, if you have a two objects, right? Two objects going like this. Two objects going like that. And they're actually going this way. The wind's gonna come around and go just flow right past it, no problem, right? So, yay. However, let's put those objects a little closer together and see what happens. So, you got these objects going here. And now, when the air flows and wants to go this way, it's actually interfering with the aircraft that's flowing and wants to go that way this wants to go this way around it and this airflow wants to go this way around it there's where you get some kind of air interference that's interference drag right there um, and yes it does happen where the fuselage meets the wing however uh, I just don't like how they, the way how they um, describe this so anyway uh, that's the basics of parasite drag uh, now we're gonna go into induced drag all right as I said we have lift it's going this way. Yes, I'm getting a lift. And when I get lift, it's going through the air. Uh, it's going to create some kind of uh, drag, right? 
This right here is your lift induced drag. This right here has an effect on your ground effect too, as uh, we'll get into a little bit later on um, in, in this video, but uh, this is lift induced drag. So anytime you have a lift, you have lift induced drag. Now, what does this have to do with adverse yaw? We have our airplane here, right? All right, let's say we want to turn to the right. So I'm going to have this up. Oh my gosh, I'm trying to do this with one hand. All right, so we got one aileron up, and uh, that, is, that, is, that is really not realistic at all. There, there we go. <laughs> all right, so we got one aileron up. We got one aileron. Oh, this thing is not really stable. There we go. All right, so one aileron's up, one aileron's down. What, which one is going to create lift? Obviously, your left aileron. So when this one lifts up, creates lift, it's creating drag. So what's going to happen is when this airplane turns, it's actually going to yaw to the left. Why? Because this airplane, this wing, this side of the wing is creating drag. When you have drag, it's going to pull that back toward you. All right. Uh, so in order to compensate for us, we have these ailerons. We have differential ailerons. We have uh, freeze type ailerons. So on the, let me see, on this side, the one that's going up. So you have an aileron that's going down. You have an aileron that's going up. The more that this creates lift, um, the more drag you have, right? However, let's say we wanted to uh, put this aileron down like maybe that much. And let's put this aileron over here up that much more. So we don't have that much adverse yaw. So instead of going down that far, we're actually gonna put you up like, uh, like right there, right? Not all the way down. And then, oh, my wing came off, anyway. <laughs> anyway, and then this one is gonna go up higher. This one's gonna go up like this. So yeah, it's not gonna create as much drag on this side. And you have this side really pushing that down, right? So that way you don't have that, when you do turn, you don't have that much uh, adverse y'all pulling this wing back. Uh, so that is your freeze type, I'm sorry, you, that's your differential uh, type ailerons. So it's differential, differential, because they're different, right? They're different. All right, <clears throat> now, um, the other one. All right, and another, uh, the other type is the, uh, the freeze type. So the freeze type, um, but let's say that we don't have the differential. Okay, this is just not helping me at all. I'm going away. All right. And it's not really helping that I'm trying to do this with one hand either. But anyway. All right, so the aileron is going to go down. This aileron is going to go up. Okay. So just like I said, the, uh, your left side is going to create drag. So it's going to cause it to yaw. However, what happens if we can add some kind of drag on this aileron, the right aileron, to compensate for that left turning tendency. How can we add drag on the right aileron? Well, if we, when that aileron goes up, part of that aileron actually is exposed on the lower half of the wing. Now what happens to the right side of this aileron? Obviously that's gonna create some kind of drag right there. That little bit of drag is just enough to compensate from that left turning tendency because now you have a uh, you have a left pole on the left aileron from the lift induced drag but you have drag pulling you back to compensate on the right side from the uh the freeze type aileron uh the cessna actually has both they have uh, both a differential and uh freeze type ailerons you can actually uh next time you're actually out there i'd recommend you go to the back of the wing <clears throat> and then you lift up the, all right, let's see if I can do this in a three-dimensional um, picture here. All right, so here's your wing. Cool, here's the, then here's the airplane over there. Here's your, your flaps, whatever. Anyway, so <clears throat> what you did is you put the yoke to the left and you put this aileron up. Get a pen or something and right where this, well, here's the, Here's a little, this is where the, so when it's down, it goes, goes right there. I don't know if this is, 
probably confusing the heck out of you guys. Anyway, um, get a pen or something and measure it from there to here, to where the aileron uh, uh, maxes out. Go to the other side, or don't even go to the other side, um, and then put the, put this aileron down. And when this when this aileron is down. This distance should be a lot shorter from here. So when it's down, it's, it's going to go down a, a very little. When it goes up, it's going to go way up here. So that's how you can prove to any kind of examiner that yes, I do have uh, uh, free. I'm sorry, uh, differential type ailerons. And if you have a little gap, so you look underneath your wing, and then just like I was saying, you got your aileron up. If you have uh, part of your airline kind of dipping below your wing uh, then hey then you have uh, uh, differential I'm sorry uh, freeze type ailerons so those are the uh, those really help with adverse yaw and it all has to do with uh, lift induced drag and we'll get into a little bit more in lift induced drag when we talk about ground effect all right wingtip vortices this is what I was talking about uh, there's the airliner going through a through a wall of, of, of smoke there or clouds whatever it is but as you can see the downwash um, that jetliners create this is one of the reasons why you definitely don't want to get caught up in this mess uh, because it's it's pretty serious all right so for wingtip vortices is very very simple um, I'm going to get my uh, let's see, black marker here. all right cool all right, so just like I mentioned before, with a high pressure and low pressure, you have your fuselage, you have your wing up here, yay, cool. All right, <clears throat> so as the air is flowing over, so here's a side view of the wing, as you all are very familiar with. As air travels faster over here, it's faster than it goes slow, it's fast and it goes slow, fast and it goes slow. And then this one just is the same speed, it goes all the way across. So this one is actually, the air is going a lot faster, um, and because it has to go a lot faster, you have less air molecules over here because you don't have as much air molecules packed up here than over here. Down here, you have a lot more air, air molecules packed. So this is actually gonna be a high pressure. Up here is gonna be a low pressure. The point is where, it, the point where the air travels over the wing the fastest is gonna be your center of lift. your center of lift. Um, <clears throat> that's where you're gonna have like the, the greatest uh, vacuum, uh, if you will, if your lowest pressure. Um, so, and, and oh, well here's, since I'm talking about it now, we have our stall horn right there, right? So what happens when we have, when we increase angle of attack, we increase and we increase and increase it, increase it. Oh, now look where that stall horn is. It's right where the center of it is so that's how the stall horn works uh through vacuum or the stall horn is in place of the center of lift anyway I'm trying to get up i'm actually getting off topic here <clears throat> my point is uh you have high pressure down here right high pressure high pressure high pressure you got low 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 remember the diagram that i showed you about the water right here you got low water right here so you got low pressure high pressure you got a door right there what, what happens if you take away that door obviously grab is going to pull this over here and the high pressure is going to be forced over to the low pressure high pressure always wants to go toward low pressure all the time so the high pressure is always going up always going up but it can't because the wings in the way so it's going to keep on trying to find its way up find its way up find its way up and then all of a sudden yay there it is notice the direction of the uh, of the rotation of this right so if I'm if it's going counterclockwise on the right wing okay so let's I'm gonna try to do this 3d as best I can now let's rotate this this way and it's still going um, counterclockwise now I'm going through the air so that's how you get these uh, here's the oh my gosh I'm gonna butcher this but anyway you know you get the point you have these uh, circles right right now this is this is this way that's where these that's why they're swirling and they're going backwards because the airplane is going that way if the airplane was just stationary obviously it would probably the wing would probably just look like this 
but we're not. We're moving through the air, so that's why you have this trail, right? Uh, I'll show you a video of, uh, of an airplane actually going through, and what actually happens, it actually pushes all of the air behind it downwards, which is why it's so important not to fly behind a, uh, a jetliner or an airliner um, that's heavy and, and you know, has uh, wingtip vortices. It's very dangerous. All right, so we have uh, our ground effect. As we discussed earlier, um, we have drag caused by lift. And the more lift we have, the more drag that we have. But this drag is actually, uh, it actually goes down and away from my aircraft. However, when we have something that's, that interferes with that drag, let's say, hence, the ground, then we're not going to have that much lift-induced drag. Hence, that's why the aircraft actually performs better when it's near the ground. Now, the now ground effect uh, is, is uh, it starts, you start to feel the ground effect when you're about uh, one wingspan away from the ground. Um, that's when I recommend when you start, when I say when we're in landing, uh, once you're in ground effect, okay, transition your eyes from the numbers down to the end of the runway, you know, freeze that sight picture, and then just keep the nose, that, keep the nose at the end, uh, at the end of the runway with the power to idle, um, and then you get that perfect landing every time, no matter what the winds are doing or, or, or whatnot. So um, this is the reason why we have uh, ground effect. All right, real quick about static versus dynamic stability. Uh, static is instant, dynamic is over time. So um, let me heal. Oh, cool. Yeah, I can see my mouse. All right. So down here, um, um, I have my mouse over the lower left right here. Um, so the aircraft we have has a really good uh, static and dynamic uh, positive stability. So if you were to take a ball and you were to roll it, put it, put it over here, it's going to eventually go back to the center. That is the positive static or dynamic stability. If it's instant, then it's static. If it's over time, then it's uh, dynamic. Um, so if we have our aircraft cr uh, set for cruise and we tr we got an aircraft trimmed out, everything's good and it's straight and level. However, go ahead and what happens if you pull that yoke back a little bit? Obviously, the nose is going to climb, your airspeed is going to drop a little bit, and then you let go of the yoke. Eventually, the aircraft will actually, over time, it's going to, the nose is going to go back down. Why? Because it's, you, you lost airspeed. So the nose is going to go back down. It's going to go down. It's going to increase airspeed. And when it increases airspeed, it's going to go back up. And eventually, it's going to level out and go straight and level exactly how you have it uh, trimmed out for whatever airspeed or, or whatnot that you had it trimmed out in the first place. Um, so that's um, positive stability. Now, neutral is if we, let's say we, uh, we, we put the yoke back and, we, and the nose went up 10 degrees and it just stayed there, just stayed at 10 degrees without trimming it or anything like that. That's neutral uh, stability. Whether if it's static or dynamic, it's going to be just neutral. If you put the, you put the yoke down and the aircraft just stays in a nosedive, regardless of how much airspeed <laughs> we're going, uh, it's kind of dangerous there. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's neutral stability. And finally, negative stability is, uh, let's say we pull the yoke up just a little bit, and what's going to happen is the aircraft is going to actually um, ex uh, keep accelerating that uh, pull. Would, in other words, uh, if you pull just 1G and just let go of the yoke, it's going to go automatically 1G, one 1.5, one 2Gs, 3Gs, 4Gs, and it's going to keep increasing and increasing and increasing. That is negative uh, static stability. And uh, I'll show you a graph here. All right, so here is a, and I pulled this directly out of the PHAC too, uh, as you can see. So here's all of the, um, um, the positive and negative and neutral statics all our, our stability is all right here so let's start with this red line right here so this red line okay I'm pulling it I put the yoke down it's gonna go down it's gonna gain speed it's gonna gain speed it's gonna go up and it's gonna go up and it's gonna it's just getting crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier this is your negative uh, dynamic um, stability right here it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse uh, as, I w as I said my uh, earlier if I were to push the yoke down and it just kept going down and down and down and down and down, that's going to be your negative stability. Uh, in this case, they just have it going up and up and down. Um, neutral uh, is if there is no change, it just stays the same. So it's this one right here, it's just going to be going down, it's going to be going to this alti altitude right here, it's going to go up to this altitude right here, it's going to stay, then it's going to go down, go back to that same altitude. It's never going to recover, it's just going to keep going and going and going.
However, how the Cessnas work, they have the positive static or dynamic stability, is they're going to, you push the yoke down, it's going to go down again, gain some extra speed, and then it's going to start correcting itself. It's going to start correcting and correcting and correcting, and eventually it's going to find itself back um, on that straight line, how you had it before. Okay, and uh, wing shapes, there is all kinds of different wing shapes out there. There's a, actually a lot more than these six right here, but uh, like I said, due to simplicity, I'm just gonna main, I'm just gonna take um, what's out of the P-hack. Um, ours is obviously gonna be this one right here. Uh, this wing is actually uh, excellent for slow flight, um, stalls, and you know, all that good stuff. You definitely want it, you, you want your wing to stall in the very root. Uh, near the fuselage and then it, it, it stalls outwards like this. So this is the uh, order and how the wing would stall. Now if you have this high taper wing, this would, I would never want to stall on this aircraft because if you do stall, um, all you have <laughs> is your elevators. Your ailerons are completely uh, useless. You can't use them at all. So if you really do need to turn or whatever, you, you can't, you're screwed. Um, and the same, th oh, and the same thing with all these other ones too. Um, you're you can't really do anything. Uh, this elliptical wing, uh, this old World War fighter wing, uh, they consider this to be the perfect designed wing. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's it's. I mean, I can go a lot more in depth with that. But um, the elliptical wing, you know, it it stalls at the very at the trailing edge first, and it goes up equally throughout the entire wing. Uh, however, when this the wing stalls, I mean, you're stalled. You you lost your entire wing. Um, so that's one thing. I wouldn't never want to stall uh, in a, an, an elliptical wing. As far as apps, uh, asp, uh, wing aspect ratios, you have this very long wing right here. So you have a lot of lift. A lot of lift. You got lift here, you got lift here, you got lift here, you got lift all this long, super long lift, right? Uh, how much drag do you have? Remember we talked about form drag? So we don't really have a lot of form drag here because it's so skinny. Once the air hits it, it's it's gone before it even realized, you know, uh, hey, what just happened? Oh, that was just a wing. <laughs> you know, it's so skinny. Uh, it's not going to really, it's not going to really uh, have that much effect on drag. Um, and these wings are really good for gliders because uh, they actually need a wing that does not produce a lot of drag because they don't have engines. Uh, we, on the other hand, we have engines, so we can actually deal with some drag. Uh, we don't need our super, we don't need these long super wings uh, because we got engines and we can deal with the drag. So, um, so that's the difference between the, the aspect ratios uh, with, with the wings. Uh, the Diamond Twin Star actually has a, uh, it's, it was designed from a glider manufacturer. That's why if you look at the, at, at the wings on a Twin Star, it's actually, um, it's, it's, it, they're pretty long, uh, flimsy wings um, for, the, for the Twin Star, but anyway. All right, moving on. Left turning tendencies. Um, I will go over the P factor in the uh, on the dry erase board, but for now, before I get there, I want to go over the torque. Uh, this is uh, Newton's third law. Every action has a positive and negative, uh, re an opposite reaction. So if you have the propeller going this way, the airplane is going to want to go the other way. Uh, makes a lot of sense, right? So the propeller spins. Uh, by looking at it, obviously, that the way we're looking at it, if it is rotating kind of clockwise, the airplane is going to want to go clockwise, hence turning to the uh, turning to the left. Uh, again, right here we have a left turning tendency because as the propeller, uh, and I'm on the top right, but I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, the propeller is going to be turning um, clockwise re relative to the pilot now, not this picture, but this one. So if it's turning clockwise, the slipstream is going to continue to go around just as the propeller is, and it's going to keep on going around until it hits the left side of the vertical stabilizer. So if you have pressure, you have force on the left side of the vertical stabilizer, what direction is the aircraft going to turn? Obviously it's going to go to the left. Uh, gyroscopic possession, this is mainly for uh, tail uh, tail draggers. Um, I'll actually do this on the, on the, on the, uh, on the board too. Um, actually no, I'll do another picture of this. Uh, but anyway, um, I will go back to the gyroscopic right now. Let's go to the board for P factor. All right, one of the things I want to demonstrate is the uh, the P factor uh, that I really want to demonstrate because I really didn't get this uh, when I was first uh, learning. Um, now, <clears throat> when the propeller is um, doesn't have any kind of angle of attack, and if you look, it's it gets the same bite of air uh, through the both the descending and the uh, ascending blade. The descending and ascending blade, same angle of attack. So there's no P factor right here. However, 
once the once you start climbing, so there's a side view. So there's the side view. Once you start climbing and increasing that angle of attack, the blade, the left blade, is just slicing upwards through the air. There's no there's no bite at all through the air. However, on the right side, it's getting a much bigger bite. So I'm going to let's try to demonstrate this best I can. So here is regular angle of attack. As you can see, both of the blades have their width, their same exact, right? However, what happens when I add angle of attack? Wow, look at that. Look at the left side. It's just a, it's a thin little line. It's just slicing up through the air. However, you got the right side. Look at all that. You have that big old blade slicing through the air while this one's just slicing right through, all right? This is what it looks like at a, at a top down view at high angle of attack. And now this is going to be at a normal angle of attack. And that's why there's no P factor there. And that's why there is P factor there angle of attack. So, all right. So hopefully that was a, hopefully that was a comprehensive note. I want to go over a gyroscopic procession. Again, this is not, doesn't really pertain to us. Um, but, uh, it pertains more to tail draggers. So this next one, so we have a force going this way, right? Why? Because we have the tail, as the tail goes up, as a, actually, you know what, let me, oh, that's the, that's the spin, so I will go that, hey, we're almost done. All right, let me use this as an example. All right, so we have this, can I make this bigger? Uh, whatever. All right, so we got a tail dragger right now, right? It's on the ground, right? As it's going down the runway, it's actually going to start rotating up like this, and then it's going to take off. That's how tail draggers take off, right? They don't take off with the tail still on the ground because look how small that wheel is. It's very, very, very tiny. So they'll be going down the runway. As soon as they hit that airspeed, they're going to they're gonna swing that tail up and then take off. So when you have that force of the tail going up, let me get, let me get my little uh, arrow here. Uh, let me use this one. So we have force going from from this tail going this way, right? So when that force is applied, it uh, it it's hitting the very top of the propeller. Remember, the propeller is spinning um, uh, clockwise uh, it, uh, from the view of the pilot, right? So if this is spinning clockwise, this due to precession, the force is going to be applied 90 degrees from the initial force and then that's when it's going to apply. So if this force is going out this way, uh, where's my, um, there we go. This force is hitting the propeller over here. It's not going to really affect it until it's down here. So if you have, if you have force um, on this side of the propeller, obviously it's going to push the aircraft this way. It's going to be going that way because of this whole 90 degree thing. Um, it's kind of hard to explain with the PowerPoint thing. Um, I, should, I probably should have just did this part on the, on the board. But anyway, um, if you have any questions on this, just uh, just let me know. But that is the four forces, uh, le uh, left turning tendencies of the aircraft. And I guarantee you the examiner will be asking you this, whether for your private instrument or uh, commercial. All right, and lastly, spins. Yay, we are at the end. Um, so there is uh, different stages in the spin. When a spin happens, there really isn't a okay. Well, now I'm in the incipient stage of the fin uh, of the spin. Oh, now I'm getting in the develop uh, development portion of the spin. Now I'm in the fully developed portion. Okay, now I'm going to go into the recovery. Now I'm going to. It just happens. It's it just it happens. But if anybody asks, uh, when you're trying to get your spin endorsement, uh, this is the kind of things you will have to know. Uh, so literally a spin in a nutshell is an uncoordinated stall. So when we have those left turning tendencies, when we're doing power on stalls, uh, if we don't keep that right rudder in, guess what? We're gonna we're gonna stall uncoordinated. Both wings will stall, but one swing will stall more. Um, due to P factor, and as you can see over here, and I got this off of Bold Method. Bold Method is, is a really good information uh, resource that I highly recommend you guys uh, go over to. Well, if you're a private instrument, commercial, it doesn't matter. Astronaut, they have all kinds of um, great information. Uh, but yes, you'll have a more stalled wing, and that's why the aircraft will actually dip. This wing will just just drop, um, and then you'll end up in a just in a, in a corkscrew. Um, 
when you are in a spin, let's say in the uh, in, in the incipient um, part of the stage, the aircraft isn't really getting that much uh, uh, dy aerodynamic forces acting on the plane. It's just dropping through the air. Um, you got to think when you're at a power off, uh, power on stall, how fast are you going when you really start your spin? You're probably going like I don't know, maybe 30, 20, 30 knots. Um, and then that's when you start, and so the, the aircraft is literally dropping through the air at a nice, gentle, comfortable 20, 30 knots. Now when you start getting that, uh, getting that nose downwards in your recovery phases, then that's when you start getting uh, the airspeed starts to get up, and you've got to be really gentle when you pull out of it because that's when you can uh, exceed the aircraft's limitations because you're pulling all those Gs. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to go over to the board really quick and uh, explain the rest of this. The only thing I want to do on the dry erase board is understand why or, or explain why we have to do power to idle. Uh, it's a very important one. Um, the way that the Cessna is designed, uh, if you look at the POH on some of them, it doesn't really, you can't really see it on this one, but um, you'll notice that some the propeller, oh shoot, I, let me put my camera right. Um, the propeller is actually angled downwards some, on some of them. It looks like it's going like, it's pointed toward the ground on some of them. Uh, or some, sometimes the ailerons may, I'm sorry, the elevators may they seem like they, they're angled up. So for example, you got your prop wash going this way and you got your, your elevator uh, like this, not really aligned. You would think that the propeller would be angled this way and then your elevator would be aligned with the uh, prop. That's not the case. It's actually pointed like this. Why? There's center of gravity and there's center of lift, as we talked about um, uh, before. So we have, oh shoot, okay, whatever. <laughs> anyway, uh, so our center of gravity is actually, let me see if I can do this with one hand here. Center of gravity is right here, right? When we do our weight and balance, try to color that in best I can. And then we have our center of lift. Our center of lift is actually like right here. Right here. Right? So remember the fastest point where the air travels over the wings? So our center of lift is like right here. Right? And then our center of gravity is right there. So if we didn't have an elevator, guess what? The weight would actually get, cause the aircraft to go, you know, go down. Right? Um, so in order to increase the stability, we have our prop wash hitting the elevator back here and is forcing the elevator to go downwards. So that's why we have our propeller going down here, hitting our aileron just like this. So it's constantly pushing the wind right here and it's causing the aileron, um, elevator, I keep, oh my gosh. <laughs> causing the elevator to actually recompensate from that uh, from that um, Ford CG, which is wanting to push the nose down. Uh, why do we have that? Well, obviously you got the engine in the front. You know we got our pilots right there and everything like that. And what's back here? There's literally no weight back here. There's nothing back there. All the weight's in the front. That's another reason why most of the weight and the CG and everything is, is in front of the center of lift. So, what does this have to do with power to idle when you're in a spin? Well, if you're in a spin, uh, obviously you want to gain, you want to put the aircraft down so you can get that speed and get some air underneath those wings so you can regain control of the aircraft, right? Well, it's going to be really hard to regain speed if you can't put the nose down. If you have all this power uh, in the airframe, what, what is that propeller doing? To this elevator it's pushing this downwards you're trying to go down to gain speed but you have all this power and the airplane wants to go up when you are trying to go down that's why you have to go power to idle uh, it just makes it a lot easier it makes recovery a lot quicker um, if you have uh, uh, a lot of power in you can potentially put yourself in a flat spin and a flat spin is normally just you're just it's it, the aircraft's up and you're just twisting like this and there's good luck getting out of a flat spin because that's it's going to be very 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 difficult um, now the spins that we're used to is we're going we're going and literally an uncoordinated stall you're going both stall, both wings are stalled but one is stalled more than the other and then you ended up going down and then i mean the aircraft is already kind of pointed down in, in the in the um uh while you're while we're in a spin 
Uh, but you imagine if you still had the power in, you're going down, you're trying to gain speed, but due to the power, you're, the prop wash is pushing this elevator down. And then guess what? You're already going at what, what 20, 10 knots. You're, you're literally just falling directly through the air. You're corkscrewing through the air. So that's why you want power uh, to idle so you can get that nose down um, a, lot, a lot quicker. Um, everything else is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, you want the ailerons to be neutral. Uh, why? Because like I said earlier, the ailerons, if you have one aileron down or, or up, um, one can cause lift-induced drag. Uh, and then you have adverse yaw. And when you're trying to stabilize the aircraft to fly straight, it doesn't help if you have some adverse yaw if you have one of the, aile one of the ailerons causing more drag on one or, or the other side of the wing. Uh, so that's that's one reason why you have uh, <clears throat> ailerons uh, to neutral. I mean, we do have something to compensate that, which is a freeze in the differential type ailerons. However, um, why I try to make it difficult where you can just um, you can take that out of the equation by just neutralizing the ailerons. Rudder, obviously is self-explanatory. Uh, elevator, they say to briskly push it forward. I highly recommend you don't do that. Uh, most of the Cessnas uh, will recover on their own if you don't touch the elevator. However, if you don't see the ground, then yes, you go ahead and push it down. Uh, the last time I was uh, in a spin, I was actually in spin training and I briskly pushed the elevator down just like it always said, uh, how I was always trained. And I almost put us in a inverted, uh, inverted spin. Uh, it's very, very dangerous. So um, I highly recommend you, I mean, no, that is in a step, but when you're actually doing it for real, I recommend you just do these three, unless you're not nose diving down, getting uh, airspeed in, uh, then you go ahead and briskly put the nose forward uh, to prevent you and to prevent you from going into a, uh, a flat spin. All right, so again, if you are still with me, thank you very much. I hope this was not too dry. I hope this wasn't uh, a little too informative or too over the top. Uh, like I said, uh, this is gonna be for all private instrument and commercial pilots. Uh, at the private level, this is literally all you need to know uh, for instrument and commercial. I would recommend that you go a little bit more in depth, do a little bit more research. Uh, where do you find that research? And the PHAC. Um, for example, like the air, uh, the wing uh, aspect ratios, you know, there's a formula for that uh, to get the, uh, the um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the coefficient of lift of the equation. How do you get that? That's going to be in the PHEC. Again, you don't really have to memorize it, but just know where to find it, as I always say. Uh, the other resources I'd recommend, YouTube. If there's something that you, you don't understand, YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. How do I do a VG diagram? How do I do this? How do I, uh, what's the four uh, left turning tendencies of, of whatever? Um, uh, Ember Riddle, uh, special VFR. I'll write this on here too. Let me go here. Because I don't think I mentioned this in here. So E R A U special VFR. They have all kinds of crazy videos. Now, if you just go to Google, I'm sorry, YouTube, and just type this in, I mean, you're going to be like I don't know, fifty thousand videos. However, if you do um, what I would do is I would do E R A U. Uh, let's say you want to learn about uh, engine systems. E R A U engine systems and then you hit enter and then you're going to have your Embry Riddle special VFR video on engine systems and it is so intuitive and, and comprehensive um, it's very graphical it explains everything in nice uh, uh, detail that makes sense it's really good so I highly recommend uh, you look at uh, ERAU um, uh, in, in that case in that part when you look at uh, YouTube Google <clears throat> again if you have a lot of conflicting information, um, Bold Method is, is one really good one that I highly, highly recommend you go to. They have information about everything. They have videos. They have, um, um, what do you call those, podcasts and all the other good stuff. So I highly recommend you, you do that, especially for instruments, too. They have a really good in, in a video on instrument. Um, but that is literally it. Um, again, thanks for watching. And like I said, give me some really good feedback. Uh, the, the more honest you are, the better I can make these videos. And I'm going to try to make them as quicker and as possible next time. But unfortunately, it was a lot of information we went over. So uh, give me your next uh, recommendation that you uh, want me to make a video. And until next time, stay safe out there, guys. Stay healthy. And uh, I'll see you guys uh, next time. See you.